Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lorraine DeBono, the managing partner at FLG Partners, which is the leading interim CFO and board advisory firm in the US. We serve clients globally. Welcome to our 10th edition of CFO Insights. So today, we're very happy to have new FLG partner William Atkins join us for lessons learned by a technology CFO. So before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about William and his professional background. So he joined us in late 2023 with a career spanning over 30 years as a CFO in both public and private technology companies, from enterprise level to high growth, VC and PE backed businesses. William has executed IPOs, M&A, divestitures, and public and private debt and equity offerings. And he has deep experience, experience managing platform roll-ups, valuations, strategic acquisitions, and divestitures. His tenure as CFO also includes international operations in North America, Europe, Asia, and South America. And before his CFO career, William held senior investment banking positions at Morgan Stanley and S.G. Warburg. So welcome, William. We're so excited that you joined us. Thank you. All righty. So before joining FLG, you spent, as I mentioned to our audience, the last 30 plus years of your career working for tech companies, both public and private, domestic and international. So give us, if you will, a snapshot of a few of those key roles that you've held during your career. And then tell us a little bit about what you believe you accomplished in those roles. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. I'll focus on the highlights of my career as a CFO, but as you've kindly highlighted, um, I started out as an investment banker, and it was my experience as an investment banker that helped me to develop both the analytical and execution skills, but also the broader situational awareness that have really helped me succeed as a CFO. Over the course of my career, I've been fortunate to have had a broad exposure to a broad range of businesses from startups to public companies. My first CFO position was at Intelsat, which was a billion dollar plus mm -hmm. revenue global satellite business. And there I had been brought in to take the company public, but I determined that an outright sale of the business could well deliver more shareholder value. And so we ended up running a two track process where on the one hand, I prepared the company for an IPO and on yep. the other, I prepared for a potential sale of the business. And this was a great result at the end of the day. We achieved uh, $5.1 billion of proceeds for our shareholders via leverage buyout. That's pretty darn awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I then spent a few years in Washington, DC, investing in both established and startup uh, businesses as a partner in a fund before mm -hmm. getting recruited to come out to California to serve as CFO of Calix, a New York mm -hmm. Stock Exchange listed provider of telecommunications systems software and services. The company had been IPO'd roughly four years before I joined them. Mm -hmm. And while a lot of really good work had been done on building solid internal systems and processes, the business had missed investor guidance a few too many times. Mm -hmm. So to address this, I made sure that the management team began working more in unison mm -hmm. and with a spirit of common ownership of our underlying forecasts and results and so this ensured that everybody was aligned with the underlying realities of the business, with the result being share price outperformance and obviously, therefore, relying upon based upon much greater um, accuracy. In fact, Calix's share price outperformed that of our nearest peer by 25 percent during my time with the company as its CFO. Another great success. Thank you. Terrific. And then after Calix and having previously invested in startup companies, I had caught the startup bug. And I wanted to gain operational experience as a startup CFO. And so my startup experiences included establishing the finance operations at One Concern and at Clarify Health, and an upgrading the financial reporting and governance at Aerobotics. In these companies, my responsibilities extended beyond finance to include the entire GNA function. And so recruiting staff, creating new organizational structures, implementing processes, and adopting new systems were key ingredients for my operational success. Mm -hmm. And then on the financing and strategic side, I was able to raise incremental capital for both Clarify Health and for One Concern. And I also put in place a key strategic partnership for One Concern with Sampo, one mm -hmm. of Japan's leading property and casualty insurers. And 
then before joining FLG, my most recent position was the CFO of Mobilion, where I was asked by HIG, the private equity firm, to join the company as CFO after they had acquired control. The company had been a platform roll-up, whereby a number of companies had been previously acquired and been put under a single umbrella. And so as CFO, I focused on integrating this disparate set of businesses so that we could gain greater efficiencies and market penetration, as well as focusing on raising incremental capital for the company. You know, that's a really impressive background, William, and it, great for the audience to hear about it. And in fact, tell the audience, and then I'm going to ask you a more personal question after you answer this one. So tell the audience more about what you see as the major differences between being in a large company mm -hmm. versus an early stage company as a CFO. Sure. Uh, that's a great question. In, in a large company, a CFO has a large staff that they can leverage. So the ability to delegate and to internally communicate strategic and financial goals across the entire company is key. And then there's the external dimension, where the CFO is a critical player in interacting with all of the constituencies of a company and all of its stakeholders. In an early stage company, so much of the job is about scaling the business. Mm -hmm. So there's a major focus on building teams, processes, and systems from what is often a blank slate. It's also important to recognize that startups go through a lot of iterations, particularly on product and on go-to-market, over relatively short periods of time. So maintaining financial discipline while allowing for that flexibility is really important for a startup CFO. So not to put you on the spot, but sort of, which situation do you like better and why? I like them both, frankly. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that, I, that I, I've that i often said is that there's no such thing as a cookie cutter situation. Correct. Um, I yeah. have yet to see that as a CFO. Mm -hmm. And so I find in earlier stage businesses, I can get very excited by the underlying technology and by the mm -hmm. fact that we're not just rolling out you know, a new product, but we're actually sort of advancing the frontiers in a way. Whereas right. for established company, you're not doing that, mm -hmm. but an awful lot of it is about allocating capital appropriately and knowing when to give people enough rope to take risks while also maintaining corporate disciplines. A great answer. Uh, <laughs> you like them both. <laughs> I, I know do. which one I like, I like better, but it's all about you today. <laughs> all righty. So, I know during your career, you've worked across geographies and cultures to implement new business processes at several global international companies. So how has that framed your perspective as a CFO? Well, I mean, the beauty of being in finance is that we finance people all speak the same language, regardless of whether we're sitting in the Valley, yep. in Tokyo, or in Paris. The numbers have to add up. They have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. And they have to help us understand the business and to tell the story about the business both internally as well as externally. Now, that doesn't mean, as a CFO, that you should just steamroll in and impose rigid, culturally insensitive values or modes of working on your global teams. And we've probably both have seen this. Uh, as you know, if you impose on a global team a certain rigid culture, what happens is, right, you lose people's hearts and minds, then you start having large attrition, and that's when all the problems start. So completely agree with you. So go ahead and continue. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, as an example of how things can be different, accounting systems and principles can often be different across geographies. And these differences need to be understood so that a centralized corporate view can still be formulated. And on the softer but equally important side of things, you need to understand the culture you're operating in. Absolutely. Uh, I know, for example, that my Japanese colleagues see after work interactions being critical for morale, but also for informal information exchange. Mm -hmm. and so I need to give them that space. Uh, to take another example, uh, I also know that my Indian colleagues might be oriented towards a more hierarchical way of working and of organizing themselves. Yes. And so I need to interact with those colleagues by keeping that aspect in mind. Mm -hmm. When it comes to international acquisitions, it's important to treat the rest of the world with the same rigor as you would apply to your own domestic business. Again, the numbers have to be consistent, they have to be timely, and they have to tell us something meaningful about the business. Mm -hmm. And so one way that I found that works is to eliminate any divisions that might exist between domestic and international teams. For example, the person who's responsible for revenue accounting should be responsible across the globe. Absolutely. So they will have to step up and expand their knowledge in order to understand all of the nuances that result from having a global scope. 
The same applies to, say, an FP&A person who's, who's responsible for supply chain. They have to be globally knowledgeable and responsible. So I guess the way to summarize it here is that for a CFO, the rest of the world cannot be out of sight and out of mind. I could not agree with you more. And what's so amazing to me is how sometimes companies don't follow that mantra. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get into trouble. So could not agree with you more. So now let's pivot to one of our favorite subjects these days is raising capital or mm -hmm. not being able to. So yeah. tell us about raising capital and the unique challenges that you see are being felt by technology companies in particular when trying to obtain financing for today's for, for growth in today's very tight capital markets. Sure. Well, I, I, so much of it depends upon the stage and type of company that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, starting with the public companies, an important thing to bear in mind is that sell-side research, so investment banks research, is simply not as in-depth or therefore as thoughtful as we would all want it to be. Hmm. Research analysts are simply run off their feet. They have to cover large numbers of companies with relatively limited resources. And so this often leads to a, a beat and raise culture around mm -hmm. corporate earnings guidance. And a public company CFO knows that their ability to manage this aspect of a company's disclosures will have a meaningful impact on investor attitudes. Mm -hmm. So management of investor dialogue is where the old adage about a reputation taking years to be built, but only an instant to be lost comes to mind. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, these conversations have substantial impacts on both the company's valuation and on its ease of raising capital. So the toughest part can often be changing the internal dynamics within a company, particularly when there are members of the senior management team who've not had previous public market exposure or experience. Mm -hmm. It's critical to get everyone on board with a culture where you're only surprising on the upside, where you're under-promising and over-delivering rather than the opposite. Well, I would say amen to that, uh, amen to that. And also having the skill as a CFO to keep uh, in check, so to speak, an over exuberant CFO, right? Mm -hmm. Who or over exuberant CEO, I should say, who over promises, but then under delivers. Mm -hmm. It's critical for the CFO to be watchful of that and really keep that CEO in check, right? As his closest conciliary. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, in the, in the non-public arena, there's a pretty clear demarcation between VC-backed companies and private equity-backed companies. Mm -hmm. For the VC-backed folks, there's an understanding that, as one of my FLG partners puts it, revenue growth solves all problems. So, of mm -hmm. course, the solidity of that revenue growth must clearly be articulated by the CFO. The CFO has to hold the line on minimizing cash burn while also ensuring that product market fit is measurable and mm -hmm. that management's not distracted from its core mission. You know, we're currently operating in an environment where every cent counts. As another one of our colleagues puts it, a good CFO knows how to run a business on fumes. <laughs> I agree. And as we both know, uh, in today's market, there's so many private tech companies, including life science companies as well. But a lot of tech companies, somebody I think at the JP Morgan conference said three to five thousand life science and tech companies combined private ones that may actually fold this year to due to really not following that mantra yep. cash is king and you just really need to manage it well completely agree and something else that we've seen recently in the valley has been the emergence of private equity owners mm -hmm. and you know for private equity backed companies formulation of an adherence to budget or the operating plan is critical oh yeah with the fp a team bearing the brunt of a lot of that work the private equity world is where the level of detailed information retrieval and analysis requested by the owners is substantial and unrelenting. Mm -hmm. and this is all in an environment where the typically heavily leveraged nature of the balance sheet requires the treasury function to be top notch and where the capital allocation is not particularly flexible. And then these days with higher interest rates and what can be an obscure economic outlook, there are potentially a number of private equity-backed companies out there that are dealing with downshifted operating expectations combined with higher debt service obligations. Mm -hmm. This is when the CFO has to be empowered to take appropriate cost savings actions to ensure a safe passage through the storm. Yeah, all, all terrific comments. So let's pivot again. And I know that you've been right at the center of several acquisitions, right? Restructuring divestitures. So Tell us a little bit about those and what you learned as being the CFO who has led those efforts. 
Got it. Uh, well, sure. I think, you know, my North Star in any of those situations is that the CFO must understand and drive the overall objectives associated with every acquisition or divestiture. M&A and restructuring should be core competencies of the CFOs of large businesses. You know, and I couldn't agree with you more because when they typically, when companies typically don't have the CFO front and center of restructurings and M&A, um, that's when I think deals can kind of go off the rails a little bit and the integration that happens post M&A. So completely agree. Keep yeah, I mean, I think this, go, go ahead, sorry. No, I was going to say, keep on going. All right. Um, I mean, what I would say is the CFO is often the glue that holds everybody together. It's not Absolutely. just the CFO. It's also critical that there's operational ownership and accountability by the CFO C-suite columns. And this can be for something as mundane as facilities, um, but it can also be for something as high visibility as, say, product development. So the leaders of such areas as sales and marketing or R&D should be held accountable for an acquired entity's success, with the CFO being seen as their partner who delivers the analytical tools and cadence that empower their operating teams. Another quality that's really important for a CFO to be successful in these situations is intellectual curiosity and strategic awareness. Mm -hmm. and, and here's an example that I think really bolsters with the comment that you made just a minute or so ago. Uh, my first company, Intelsat, was a joint venture in an underperforming direct-to-home satellite TV, TV business that on its surface would provide expansion into an area that overlapped with our wholesale business. Mm -hmm. Our JV partner had significantly more media content expertise and thus filled a key gap in our capabilities but there was no senior operating person who'd played a responsible role in creating the JV or informing it. Everything had been done by our corporate development function, with the end result then sort of tossed over the transom to the operating folks. Let me ask you a question. So why would a company have made that decision to not put a senior operating person who was responsible really for that JV? That just I think it goes wrong. Think yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, I think what ends up happening is that you can have people create sort of presentations where there's a responsibility and where there's a sequence of handover of responsibility, et cetera. But the reality is that the operating folks will often see consideration of M&A as being a bit of a distraction mm -hmm. because they're so busy with their day-to-day -day jobs. Got it. And then once an acquisition happens, they're sort of suddenly faced with having to, to deal with it. And there's a natural resistance to dealing with what they might um, sort of after the fact characterize as someone else's decisions or someone else's mistakes. I've seen that before. And yeah. so it's really, I think as a CFO, what I, what I try to do is to ensure that we have proper operational representation, not just court dev and finance folks sitting in the meetings that are actually stitching these acquisitions together mm -hmm. and that are doing the due diligence so that it's possible to go back to the operational teams and say, did the due diligence and say, look, you guys, you know, you saw this, you are responsible for delivering on these conclusions. To go back to this example, and again, this is a great way to, to flesh this out, um, that satellite JV that I was talking about, the region where it operated was one where most of the population lived in apartment buildings. Hmm. So to gain access to the end customer, the JV had to have good relationships with the tenants associations and with the landlords. But that was a capability they just simply didn't have. And that was what a result a of what a miss. Study. Yeah. And that was a result of a study that I'd had my operating and finance colleagues do to try to figure out what was going on and why the business was underperforming. Mm. And so we sold our interest in the venture. And so here, my role was to be the key member of the C-suite who commissioned the overall analysis and who brought its conclusions to the rest of the management team's attention. And because the CFO sits across all of the operating functions of a company, they're in a unique position to be holistic and to go that extra mile. That, that's fascinating because it's an interesting example of what can go wrong when you don't have the right hands on deck in terms of managing uh, uh, a new entity, so to speak, in a company like, in your case, uh, the JV. So it, very interesting. Um, now let's shift again. Okay. And this time to CFO relationships with board members and investors. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, um, William, CFOs and tech companies often need to work really closely with VC and PE firms as investors and board members. It's, it can be tricky, as you know, right? So what do you see as the keys to success here? Sure, I'd highlight 
four critical areas, Lorraine. Um, okay. Number one, it's important to be absolutely transparent and consistent with the board and investors. As a CFO, you're the trusted source of information. So it's important to have confidence in the integrity and conclusions of your data, but you should also have the humility and self-confidence to state when something can't be done or when something will be unknown. Absolutely. So, yeah, mm -hmm. saying no in a constructive way is a really important part of a CFO's toolkit. It's also really important to have a plan to resolve those problems that do come up. The CFO is there to provide solutions. Absolutely. I've always been ta taught when you bring a problem to your CEO, you always have to have the recommended solution or Absolutely. solutions. And a lot of people don't do that. No, you have to do it. Because if at that, at that level- That's company, your job. <laughs> yeah. If at that level of the company, you're still trying to figure it out. That's not good, frankly. Exactly. <laughs> um, it, it's what you're paid to do. Um, and then the second thing I think is important is to have that uh, complete and open dialogue with the chief executive officer. Mm -hmm. uh, there can be times, particularly when there are private equity owners, when the chief executive and the rest of the management team can see you, the CFO, as being an investor implant. And this could not be further from the truth. The way to ensure that everyone sees that you're on the same team and that you're pulling in the same direction is by being transparent and consistent. Totally. This helps hugely in presenting a united front to the management team, of the management team, I should say, to the board and to investors. And then a third thing that companies often do that is entirely avoidable is to have fire drills. You shouldn't have them. You need to avoid fire drills mm -hmm. or last minute panics around board meetings and investor communications. Totally. The scheduling of these interactions is 100% predictable. The CFO has an important role to play, particularly in an earlier stage VC-backed company in helping the management team to anticipate the issues that would be focused on at those meetings and to prepare well ahead of time. Could not agree more. And we've done several workshops about CFO relationships with their board and their CEO. And at every one, the mantra is the same. Preparation and rehearsing is absolutely key for absolutely. A CFO. Yep. Absolutely. Completely. It's hard to get everybody moving in unison initially, but once they do, the noise just goes out of the room. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I've consistently had CEOs and board members tell me that, you know, once I've had a process underway, they're able to focus on the key issues and not have a lot Absolutely. of distractions. Absolutely. Um, I think the other thing that's important, the final sort of fourth aspect, is that VCs and PEs like having a CFO who's their intellectual peer. Mm -hmm. This is someone who understands where they're coming from. So the CFO needs to be a person who can flesh out what investors want and how it can be executed. The CFO is someone who can brainstorm with board members and with the chief executive in order to help them and the company become more effective. And so my job as a CFO is to provide tools for the company's CEO and the company's backers to have important discussions about a company's strategic direction and performance. And I can really do this best if I have open and frequent interactions and communications with those individuals. Absolutely. The CFO also has to know how to play across the board in the C-suite, mm -hmm. right? He has to absolutely be able to understand, establish analytics, et cetera, et cetera. And then as you said, um, he has to have the ability to persuade and influence the C, his, not only his C-suite peers, but the CEO. And a lot of it is communication style, preparation, yep. uh, focusing on the facts and all of that good stuff. So completely agree. Um, as we pivot again, um, tell us what your best experience working with the CEO has been and the why of it. Sure. Um, something that I've really enjoyed about some of the CEOs that I've worked with is that they've become good friends and that our relationship has continued well beyond my time with them as their CFO. A CEO's job can be lonely. Mm -hmm. The CFO often being one of the few members of the management team that the chief executive officer can be very open with and whom she or he can bounce ideas off of. Absolutely. And that relationship is very much anchored in the CFO's role of being an open and objective conciliere, even if their insights can be unpleasant for the CEO to hear. The CEO knows that they're going to be given the true story here. And I and I would only add here that, um, you know, friendships with CEOs, particularly as they develop over time, right? When the CEO and you learn to trust each other, so important. But there also has to be a certain arm's lengthness. But mm -hmm. in that relationship, right, so that you can keep on being upfront and sometimes tough with the CEO, right, in terms of yep. delivering messages that maybe he or she don't doesn't want to hear, right? 
or, or maybe they want to hear it, but they haven't heard it before. If you yeah, know. yeah, good one. Absolutely. So, um, and I, I, th I would say that if I look back over the companies where I've worked, there are a couple of CEO relationships that stand out. Mm -hmm. um, one was that first CFO job at Intelsat, where I brought fresh thinking and approaches to the company, both regarding the IPO as well as to its acquisitions and its divestitures. The CEO entertained those new ideas, and he gave me air cover to overcome the internal momentum that had been built mm -hmm. up. So that we could shift priorities from what the company had been to what it could become. And we thus maximized a lot of shareholder value. And so that CEO's openness and sponsorship really helped the management team and me to deliver. That's awesome. And then another great CEO relationship that I enjoyed was at a startup where my relatively recently minted CEO had the self-confidence. And this is really key. It's, it's really the self-confidence is a key factor to entrust me with the key negotiations with a strategic investor in their business. This investment was critical to funding the business's mission and to empowering our penetration of an important market. Mm -hmm. So combining the CEO's ability to promote the company's vision with my negotiation and financing skills meant that we were able to structure a meaningful increase in the company's capital and with an investment structure that was very favorable to the company and to its shareholders. And so the CEO's recognition of where our relative strengths lay and of the need to delegate authority accordingly was really refreshing, particularly in an environment when he and I were communicating and brainstorming on a very frequent basis. You know, when you have that great clicking relationship with a CEO, I mean, there's nothing better than that in terms of one's professional experience, because you can read each other other's mind, you you can anticipate what he needs or or she needs, what they what they want. And it's 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 fabulous. It doesn't happen often in, no. in my own experience. But when it does, it's nirvana, so to speak, from a professional standpoint. I so agree. let's go to the flip side of a great relationship with the CEO to what's what's been your most challenging experience working with the CF CEO? And then what was it like and how did you work through any roadblocks or challenges you've had with that CEO? Sure. Well, my perspective here has been influenced by where we are in the capital cycle. Mm -hmm. A lot of money has flooded, flooded into tech over the past decade. And this has occurred at a time when interest rates have been at record lows. And so now that interest rates have gone up, we're experiencing you know, Warren Buffett's famous adage that you never know who's been swimming naked until the tide goes out. And so it's been challenging for some CEOs to adjust and to and anticipate to this changed environment. Mm -hmm. So until recently, uh, management teams have been seduced by ever-increasing valuations and funding rounds. But at the end of the day, capital gets deployed to build actual businesses. Mm -hmm. Setting the ego building aside, um, ego building aspects, I should say, of fundraising aside, and focusing on grinding out a viable business is the order of the day in this new environment. Completely and utterly agree with that. So keep on going and tell, tell us a little bit more. Okay. Uh, so when I recall challenging CEO, CFO relationships that I've experienced, it's often been the case that the CEO in question was exclusively focused on metrics and business objectives that just weren't linked to measurable business results. Hmm. So as one of my mentors uh, put it to me many years ago, there's a reason why they call it work and they don't call it fun. <laughs> but, but you know, work does involve a great deal of fun. Sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it also relies a lot upon some very unglamorous ditch digging and heavy lifting. And that is necessary on the road to success for any business. You bet. And the CFO's job is to, let's face it, do a lot of that. Yep, absolutely. absolutely. So my last question to you is, as we launch our 20th year at FLG, which we're doing so in 2024, and we're very excited about that, tell us, William, what you hope to be your future areas of focus as an FLG partner. Got it. Thank you. Um, well, I've been really fortunate to have worked across the board in both public and private companies. And while I can be extremely effective in those cookie cutter situations that I referred to earlier, in reality, they rarely exist. Mm -hmm. And so I find that every company has its own unique challenges and opportunities. Uh, and the solutions that I bring to those challenges are drawn from my wide range and depth of business and financial expertise. I like unpacking problems. I like empowering CEOs and management teams to make better decisions. And I like positioning companies for growth and change. 
And so the reason I joined FLG is that I recognize that the firm is comprised of seasoned individuals who are mm -hmm. true CFOs and that they are partners to their chief executives and management teams. And they're seen as being strategic and operational leaders, as well as being financial experts. I can already tell I've found a great home and I'm working with a phenomenal group of partners who make an impact on their clients day in and day out. I mean, having been at FLG now for 14 years and managing partner going into my fifth year, what I can say is FLG is unparalleled in terms of the quality and bench strength of its CFOs. It's pretty darn amazing, in my, in my opinion. I, I, so I, I have, thought that going in, but now that I'm here, I really see it. So I completely. Oh, that's great. Well, I have no doubt that your background will find lots of opportunities here at FLG. And I'm thrilled. I really am very thrilled that you've joined us. Mm -hmm. And thank you to our audience today for listening to the perspectives that William has shared with us today as a very experienced technology CFO on the international and global stage. And for all of you, um, our audience, thank you for the conversation. Please join us for more CFO Insight interviews uh, with FLG partners. Happy New Year. Thank you.